It has been said more than once that the square of St. Mark's is, now brace yourselves for our first cliche, the drawing room of Europe. And indeed it is. But then Venice itself is perhaps the most beautiful cliche on earth. Like most cliches, Venice is best seen at its emptiest, at dawn, before the tourists arrive on the scene. For a thousand years, Venice was an independent republic, the most serene republic they call themselves, somewhat optimistically, because the history of Venice was actually a stormy one. In all of history, there have been only three million Venetians. This is an amazing statistic considering the fact that this small city on a group of islands in a lagoon at the north of the Adriatic Sea was once a great maritime empire, an empire that produced Bellini, Titian, Vivaldi, as well as Marco Polo and Casanova. Venice is a city whose streets are water and whose houses are built on a million wooden pilings. For a thousand years, no enemy ever conquered the city until first Napoleon, then the tourists. Today, Venice is a sort of Disneyland and many of the old Venetians live elsewhere some are in the United States, like my own family. We used to say, we are descendants of the Dodgers of Venice. I always liked hearing this. I certainly liked repeating it. But was it true? Who were the Vidals? Where did they start? More important, what was Venice? This unlikely watery city, where did it start? Venice first emerged, like life itself, from the mud. The mud of a large lagoon at the top of the Adriatic Sea. For several thousand years, mainlanders came here to fish, to pan for salt. But no one thought of building a city out there until the Roman Empire began to fall apart in the 5th century A.D. The barbarians, Goths and Lombards, burned and sacked the Roman cities of the mainland. The survivors, anti-Gothic to the core, moved to the islands of the lagoon. Here they were safe. They were also surprisingly successful. They built boats. They cornered the salt trade. They were able successfully to ignore even Attila the Hun, but then as an equestrian, he was probably less than charmed by all this Venetian mud. 1,563 years ago, on the 15th of March, we are told, a city was founded on one of these islands. At least that is the legend. What we do know is that this particular Venetian city, Torcello, was well established by the seventh century. Torcello quickly became an important trading center with a cathedral where a bishop sat. The Venetians have now turned their eyes to the east, to Constantinople to Byzantium, which still lives in these mosaics in the cathedral, where Christ Pantocrator surveys heaven and hell, where the Mother of God descends from the shadowless gold 
of eternity. What did a city in the sea have that people on the land wanted to buy? Well, men cannot live without salt. Today, the world is amazed by the wealth that oil has brought to Arab deserts. Well, a thousand years ago, the world was equally bemused by the fact that the Venetians had been able to make such a fortune out of their muddy lagoon with salt. In the year 810, Pepin, the son of Charlemagne, conquered the mainland. But when he tried to occupy the Venetian islands, the islanders united and they stopped him. They also realized that it was time to build a common city farther away from shore. So they moved to the islands of the Rialto, which means high bank, islands through which runs an S-shaped river known as the Grand Canal. So the Venice that we know, like the Venice that the world has known for 1,100 years, still stands on those same small islands of the Rialto. The church we now see is a version of the Church of the Holy Apostles in Constantinople. Again, the Venetians have turned to the east for inspiration, to Byzantium with its holy emperor, whose capital they scrupulously raided during the Fourth Crusade. When the Pope bawled them out, they said, we are Venetians first, Christians second. This lion, which guards the arsenal, was brought from Delos. As you can see, no lion was safe anywhere on earth if a Venetian was in the neighborhood. The lion, which had been the emblem of St. Mark, has now become the symbol of Venice and its empire. The arsenal was the heart of the Venetian empire. For the first time anywhere on earth, ships were turned out in mass production. When the arsenal was at its peak, 16,000 craftsmen worked here, and an entire fighting galley could be built in a single day. But then the word arsenal comes from an Arab word which means house of industry. So at the center of the impregnable city, in the lagoon center, was this impregnable arsenal and anchorage. From here, half the Mediterranean would in due course fall to the lion of Venice. There is an old Venetian saying, cultivar el mar e lascia star la terra. This means cultivate the sea and let the land alone. For centuries, on Ascension Day, the Venetian fleet would be collectively blessed by the Patriarch. Now, each spring, all Venetians who want to take part in the Vogelunga, or long row, can do so. They row 32 kilometers around the lagoon and back to the Grand Canal. This spring, 5,000 Venetians turned out. rows standing up so that they can study the water and the treacherous mud. Venetians are by nature watchful. Survival, success, began and ended with boats, with rowing for the great galleys, fathers taught sons, generation after generation.
It is not a race so much as a commemoration, a reminder to themselves of who they once were and are. Sea and ships, energy and cunning, buying and selling, and then empire. A city the size of New York Central Park was able to dominate half the Mediterranean, to overwhelm Constantinople, the greatest and richest city on earth, to acquire Crete, the islands of the Cyclades, the Peloponnese. By 1400, Venice controlled Corfu, the base at Nauplia, the coast of Dalmatia. By 1500, the small city of Venice had become the largest empire in the West. This is the island of Naxos, now a popular resort in the Aegean. But once upon a time, a young Venetian nobleman named Marco Sanudo, on his way back from the Fourth Crusade, seized Naxos and the other islands of the Cyclades. With the benign consent of Venice, he made himself duke. You can still see on top of that hill the fortified town that Sanudo built over 750 years ago. He settled Naxos and the other islands with friends and relations. Their coats of arms are still there. Loredan, Barozzi. This is what is left of Sanudo's castle. The masonry is held together with pink mortar from the island of Santorini, mixed for no particular reason with egg yolks. The result is harder than stone and a true monument to high cholesterol. Although Naxos is now entirely Greek and its religion Orthodox, there is still a Roman Catholic cathedral and there are still many families of Venetian ancestry. All in all, the Venetians were not oppressive rulers in the Cyclades. Since they were there to protect trade routes, each island was not so much a territory of any great value as a sort of stationary ship to be of use in the servicing of the Venetian fleet. But when Venice came to conquer the vast island of Crete, the Republic behaved with uncharacteristic stupidity. Since there were ten times as many highly bad-tempered patriotic Cretans as there were Venetians in all of Venice, Crete was an ideal place for the invaders to mind their own business, which was business, and let the Cretans govern themselves. But Crete was too important for the Venetians. They needed grain, wine, oil. So they settled a number of their noble families here and their first governor was a Tiepolo. The Venetians decided to remake Crete in their own image. They divided the island into six sections corresponding to Venice's six quarters, with the same names. They built castles which faced significantly both ways, out the sea to the enemy and inland to the enemy. They even built a version of their own arsenal. Venetian rule was so strict and oppressive that that most literary of popes, Pius II, remarked, 
As among brute beasts, aquatic creatures have the least intelligence, so among human beings, the Venetians are the least just and least capable of humanity. Today, Venice is fed like any other city, except, of course, produce comes by boat. Although a republic can be almost anything in practice, the Venetian Republic was and is remarkably consistent in its sense of self. Like the Jews, the Venetians were a minority in a generally hostile world. As we've said, from the beginning of Venetian history to the present day, there have only been three million Venetians. And because the city was so dramatically limited by the sea, the citizens were obliged to become traders. They were also obliged to be, heaven help us all, intelligent. This is rare in any society. Although the Venetians have a well-defined class system, they have never had a class war, there isn't enough space for one. Also, it would be bad for business, for Venice Incorporated, in which everyone plays his part, from the fisherman to the glassmaker to the bartender to what is left of the noble families who still do what they have always done, survive through trade. In Venice, like it or not, everyone's in the same boat and everyone is born knowing it. From the first salt merchants to the empire builders to the noble families, wealth, not fame, was the spur. But then Venetian nobles, like their American counterparts, based their wealth and glory proudly on trade. In this, both Venetians and Americans part company with those European noble families who disdain trade and base their nobility on land. Something not easy to do if you happen to live on water. The Marcello family has been prominent in Venice for a thousand years. The head of the family today is Girolamo Marcello. He's the custodian of the family's archives. He also sells insurance. I was curious about the name Marcello or Marcellus. What were the origins of it? it was it a Latin name? Is it from the... Probably it's a Latin name. From the Roman but, Republic. Uh, it's very... Uh, no, in, in, the, in the, the country, near Venice, before the barbarian invasion. And somebody says that it means Mare Cielo. This is the... Uh, the quadrants of the family. Mare and Cielo, sea and sky. And so we have the blue... Uh, sky and the, the, the gold waves of the sea. Others say that the, the, the gold uh, uh, line there are the silk. Uh, this is the gold silk commerce on the sea. The Marcello archives fill several rooms, and as he says, Somewhat sadly, no one will ever be able to read them all. This is a, a splendid ledger. What is it? Some what? Old book of. Uh, oh, this. Uh, is that 1529? 1529. 1529. Yeah. And I see a lot of credits and a lot of debits. So I think it's all credits and debits yeah. about uh, the Republic. You can find years, day by days. From every part, I see Marcello oh, family. Marcello, Marcello too, yes, yes. Uh, some, some class, some one. I must say, all these credits and debits. Credits and debits are different. 
They were very serious about money, the Venetians. Oh, yes, for Venetian money, it's really, really very important. Ah, now here's something very interesting to me. There is a Vidal, Niccolo Vidal. Vidal. What on earth did he do? Vidal is an old uh, name of the old uh, Venetian family, too. Well, and this one looks like he has bought... Well, he's in debt. He has a debt of uh, 8,898 Ducati. I must say, this is possibly a relative of mine, <coughs> Nicola Vidal, since there is a debit, which is always a, a unifying thing in the family. And so this is an example of the, the administration of the Venetian state, the yes. Venetian Republic, very detailed. My family had always claimed that at least three doges of Venice were named Vidal. On closer examination, I found that Vidal or Vitale was actually the Christian name of the doges in question. But inspired by Count Marcello's ledger books in which so many Vidals had figured owing so much money, I visited the state archives. In what used to be a monastery, there are 58 kilometers of shells. A thousand years of history turning to dust. History of the Venetian Empire, of the great families, like Tiepolo. In fact, the director of the archives is a Tiepolo, and the last of her line. I asked if I could see the famous Book of Gold in which the names of the patrician families are recorded. The one book in which I lusted to see my own name illuminated. Ah, Barbaro. As she turned the ancient pages, I saw the great names in alphabetical order. Would she never get past the bees? Tiepolo, allora ci sono le te, allora la famiglia Vidal. Non c'è, non era Patrizia. There is an old Venetian saying that if you cannot find your family in the book of gold, try the telephone directory. So having failed today to find myself in the book of gold, we will now look at today's modern Venetian telephone directory, not the 14th century one. And here are the Vidals beginning characteristically with Adone, which means Adonis. And here we go down to Bruno, Carmelo, Giorgio, who sells mineral water, wine, and beer. And it ends over here with the headquarters with nine urban lines of Vidal, Soap. Venice billed itself as the most serene republic. And here, in the palace of the Doge, the Venetian word for its elected ruler, the republic and its empire was governed. In an odd way, the founders of the American Republic were fascinated by the Venetian Republic. And there are some similarities between the two. Both republics accepted as perfectly natural human greed. Neither was filled with much spirit of mission or of ideology. That was why each republic made sure that it would never become a monarchy or 
a democracy. In this splendid room, the great council met. Every male Venetian of 25 or older, whose family was listed in the Book of Gold, was a member of the council. At one point, there were as many as 2,000 council members. The great council governed Venice. Basically, it elected not only the doge, but all the other high officers of state. The council also chose from its own members a number of committees, the college, the council of ten, the senate, and these committees governed the republic and one another. At the time of the doge's coronation, he was given a long list of those things that he could not do. The most important thing that he was not allowed to do was to govern Venice. The Venetian Republic was governed by the gentleman who sat to his left, and the gentleman who sat to his right. The doge himself was like a gilded icon. He was the state incarnate. The Venetian doge and the American president have this in common. Each swore to uphold the constitution in which were built many checks and balances that would make it impossible legally for one man to overthrow the state or even to govern the state. So where the American president has his Senate, his House of Representatives, the Supreme Court, the doge in his position had his Senate, his Council 10, and other committees who were in place with just one object, to keep the power of the state from falling into the hands of a tyrant. But even the most neatly balanced political system can become unbalanced by external enemies. Constantinople fell to the Turks in 1453, the tide slowly began to turn. Venice and all Europe was threatened by this evil empire. Venice fought back. They relied on their fleet, on their wealth, on their cunning. Particularly cunning was their placement of strategic defense systems. Complex forts like these in Greece were built to protect the Venetian seas and the free world. The Christian world of Europe was endangered by the Muslim Turks. And for the next two centuries, there was war at sea, on land, from one end of the Eastern Mediterranean to the other. PR boys went into high gear. Even the churches celebrated the far-flung empire with replicas of military bases, of victories at sea, of God's love for Venice. Christians first at last, Venetians second.
It is one of the eternal laws of government that the more money that you spend on intelligence and counterintelligence, the less you know about what's going on in the world. We have the CIA in America at Langley, Virginia, spending billions of dollars. And very often, the American government does not know all of the things that it ought to know. In this one little room, three Venetian gentlemen, known as the Three Inquisitors, were the directors of intelligence and counter. And the most serene republic was entirely well served by them. And they knew indeed what their enemies were up to. Intelligence is the key to just about everything. The more anyone knows, the better off he is. The more a state knows, particularly a small beleaguered state, the better off it is. From all over the world, Venetian ambassadors sent home information, while Venetian spies ferreted out other countries' secrets, and Venetian agents took care of Venetian enemies. The three inquisitors, in their capacity as directors of information and intelligence, counterintelligence. In the 16th century, they engaged one Agostino Amadi to make them a code book. A poor writer, his name is misspelled on his own book. And these are the 16th century codes, of which they look like there are thousands of them here in which messages would be sent back and forth from every country in Europe, Asia too, in these codes. What would happen is an ambassador would be sent out with a code and he'd send back a message. They'd put this thing with the holes over it and they would read it. That's a relatively simple code. Some of these are of a complexity. This looks like it could be Greek. Extraordinary. He's even inventing alphabets, which I think is very brave of him, since so few people master the ones they have. It was also interesting that when the ambassador came back, just to make sure that he wasn't going to appropriate one of these codes for himself for private uses, he was obliged to return it to the three inquisitors, to the state, where presumably it went back into the book here, like this one here, which turns round, and they would give it back to the inquisitors who would then send out another ambassador with it or with a brand new code. It's a very complex one. This, I suppose, that there are one, two, three, four of these things. You push one one way, one the other way. As you can see, uh, Agostino Amadi did not have much spare time. There are thousands of codes, all in one interest, which is that uh, for a Venetian, knowledge and intelligence were power. At the time of that code book, Leonardo Laredan was doge of a Venice the whole world envied. In fact, the European powers formed a league in 1508 to overthrow the Republic. But the Venetians outwitted Pope, kings, and the Holy Roman Emperor. But then Venetian resourcefulness was always peculiarly relentless. Secreta secretissima. That means top secret, eyes only, burn on sight. These are these are orders, secret orders within the council and responses to requests. And here is a, ah, Brother Joannes de Raguzio proposes to the council that for 1,500 ducats a year for life, he will kill anybody they want him to and not be caught. He has developed, I'm sight reading from the Latin, which is always difficult for me. He has got many 
extraordinary ways of poisoning people. And the good brother, doesn't say what order he belongs to, puts himself at the disposal of the council. This is his proposal to the council. Now the council then proceeds to vote whether or not to hire Brother John. Here's the vote. Ten of them said, okay, we will hire Brother John. Six are cautious and say no. And they agree to take him on at 1,500 ducats a year. But being good Venetians, there's a trial period. So they suggest in a little footnote, why doesn't he have a go at killing the Holy Roman Emperor? Although torture and summary execution were standard procedures, they were not all that common. The rulers of Venice were the first to realize that the most effective means of controlling a people are psychological, through subtle intimidation. This is the antechamber to the awesome Council of Ten. Now, the Council of Ten had many powers and responsibilities, and one of them was to ride herd on the aristocratic class of the city of Venice. So they would summon them, sometimes quite arbitrarily. You'd get a summons, present yourself to the Council of Ten next Friday. Well, the nobleman would have a good week to th worry about that. He would come here, he would sit on these uncomfortable benches, or he would pace up and down nervously, wondering what on earth it was that he had done. And this was interesting psychologically because it was a kind of warfare. When you don't have a large police force, you don't have the means of intimidating the population. You must do it through psychology. So he would have had a week to worry. He'd have all day here. And then somebody would come out and say, they don't want to see you. You can go home now. Well, they made him very, very nervous, which was plainly the object of their enterprise. Anonymous denunciations would be placed here. Should the accusation prove to be untrue, the accuser would be found out and punished. The real life of Venice goes on, as it always has, away from the palaces, and the tourists. The word ghetto means foundry, so originally there was a foundry here. Then the Jews were confined to this quarter, to the ghetto, a word Venice gave the world. Jews still live here, but then Jews were generally better off in Venice than in any other Christian city. The Venetians were nothing if not practical. Their principal trade was with the East, where the Jews had many connections. So the Venetians used the Jews as they did everyone. That is also why the Inquisition at Rome accused the Venetians of not burning enough Jews as heretics. The Venetians serenely replied that as the Jews had never been Christian to begin with, they could hardly be heretics. On the other hand, the Republic kept a cold and watchful eye on the Muranos. Jews who had converted to Christianity. It was always feared that they might be crypto-infidels. Meanwhile, back at the Ottoman Empire, thanks to Sultan Mehmet II, Venice was on the defensive. During the next century, between 1540 and 1571, the Turks conquered Nauplia, Naxos, the Cyclades, the great island of Cyprus. But the Venetians were far from finished. 
They appeal to their former European enemies. We must all stop the Turks, they said. The result was the Battle of Lepanto, where the Turkish fleet was destroyed by a European fleet to which Venice had contributed the greater part. In the battle, 8,000 Christians died, 20,000 Muslims. The West was safe for the time being. But in the next century, the Turks laid siege to Heraklion in Crete. For 22 years, the Venetian garrison withstood the enemy. Crete was Venice's last bastion. When Crete fell in 1669, the Venetian Empire was effectively ended. What had been acquired and held through cunning and resourcefulness was lost, in the end, to brute force and Islam. But life goes on with or without an empire, and each year the Voga Lunga goes on. The city of Venice, Incorporated, is still doing very well for itself. There are no doges now, there is no fleet, there are no victorious admirals. But there are still Venetian heroes, like Arrigo Cipriani, hereditary proprietor of the world's most famous bar, Harry's Bar. Cipriani is a new representative of an old tradition. This means that he is a highly ingenious creator of what the Venetians still most respect, wealth for their city. Venice has probably inspired more purple crows than any other place on earth. So, without lush adjectives, what is Venice today? Well, for the Venetian, it is, as always, a place to go on doing business. For the visitor, it is a sort of waking dream. Naturally, no Venetian ever dreams this Venice but every Venetian works hard to evoke it for others. What are we all doing here in Venice? What am I doing here in Venice when I have never met a pigeon that I liked? What are they doing here, all these people? Millions and millions of them come here every year for centuries now. Well, I have a hunch that most people who come here actually come here with the idea that they may find something that they've never known before. Certainly they will never find anywhere else anything quite like the Venetian carnival. 
or carne vale, which means flesh farewell. After one last riotous feast, 40 days of Lent, 40 days of austerity and no flesh devoured. Today's Venetians, or would-be Venetians, say goodbye to the flesh for two whole weeks to the immense joy of the Ministry of Tourism. With music, with dancing, with costumes, with masks. The object is to see but not be seen, to suspect but not to know. Mystery, ambiguity, anonymity, and theoretically, anything goes. Venice is water, Venice is glass, Venice is reflection. When glass reflects water and water glass, the effect is magical and strange. Do I wake or sleep? There is something definitely dreamlike, even surrealistic about Venice. For one thing, it's always seen twice. Once reflected, once real. A city is like any other living organism. It is born, it grows, it reproduces itself, and it dies. Or else, it adjusts to new conditions. Venice was once a world capital. Now it is a sort of Disneyland. But the city itself is still pretty much as it was. Only the people who were here then are not here now. They are gone. And obviously with time, all things grow old. Even so, the 20th century is kept firmly at bay. That is Mestre over there on the mainland, a great industrial city, a source of wealth and pollution. It is also where a great many Venetians work. But here on these islands in the lagoon, Venice is largely unchanged. What we see today is pretty much what people have seen for centuries. The Cadoro, or House of Gold, was built in the 15th century, Venice's golden age, long since vanished, along with its serene republic, its vast maritime empire, its glory and legendary wealth. The shell of Venice is as it used to be. But inside the shell, all is changed. Inside the Cadoro today, there is an austere museum with whitewashed walls. The inner spirit has fled, along with the creators. Most of the palaces along the Grand Canal are equally deceptive. The Palazzo Dario, for instance, is as showy in its own way as the Cadoro. But again, it is all exterior. In fact, during the late 19th century, it was a boarding house much frequented by American bachelors. 
while in the late 20th century, it was, for a time, the property of the manager of the Who. These palaces were built 500 years ago, but then practically all of the Venice that we see now is from that era, when time just stopped at a moment of splendor, like a freeze frame. It was also in the 15th century that the Venetians forgot their own good advice about cultivating the sea and leaving the land alone. They moved on to the mainland. They acquired the Alpine region of Friuli, where there was a good deal of timber for their ships and an undistinguished family of apothecaries named Vidal. They occupied the cities of Bergamo, Brescia, Verona, and Vicenza, where the architect Palladio lived. In the next century, Palladio was kept busy building country houses for Venetian nobles who were now very seriously landed gentry. For me, the most haunting of all these villas is Masser, which Palladio built for the Barbaro family. A Venetian palace, no matter how splendid, was always a place of work a headquarters for trade, even a warehouse. But now that the Venetians are on the mainland, everything is changed. Officially, this is a farmhouse, but plainly, it is a house for pleasure. The heirs are spending the money that their hustler forebears made. The architecture, the sculpture, reflect the change in mood. It is light, airy. Classical, harmonious, balanced. Nothing Byzantine here. This is Imperial Rome, reborn. The real magic, of course, is inside. This is a real, somewhat irritable woman, wife to the painter himself, Paolo Veronese. She looks at her husband at the far end of a series of rooms. Veronese steps through a door. He's been out hunting. Is he late? At Villa Masser, a great architect, Palladio, and a great painter, Veronese, have joined forces to create well, for once, all the adjectives of the guidebooks are inadequate. In these rooms, nothing is what it seems. Is that a real column? Or is it painted? Is that a real window? Even stranger are the people. Although dead for four centuries, they are still alive in these rooms. They watch us from a painted gallery. They half hide behind painted columns. The mistress of the house looks down on us, most suspiciously. Although the Venetians produced very little literature, they have produced an astonishing number of remarkable painters. But then, did the painters create the city, which looks like a painting, or did the city influence the painters? Certainly, every square looks like a set for an opera that is about to begin. The critic Hazlitt thought that every art is at its peak at the beginning. This certainly seems to be true 
a Venetian painting. Painters were always in great demand here. Churches, government buildings, even trade union halls wanted to see familiar stories vividly illustrated. This is a union or a guild hall. And here Carpaccio painted the story of St. George and the Dragon. Painters were regarded by the Venetians with the same mixture of reverence and contempt that we now regard film directors. When a major painter revealed his latest work, it was like a film premiere. Carpaccio was one of the most splendid of the proto-movie makers. Here is St. George, played by the Robert Redford of his day, the Dragon, special effects by Steven Spielberg. The Dragon's Dinner, youths and maidens idly gnawed. There was to be nothing ever again so horrific until our very own Texas Chainsaw Massacre. If Carpaccio was the William Wyler of Venetian painting, Tintoretto was the Cecil B. DeMille. Tintoretto, like DeMille, was at his best with crowds and fires. Here's St. Mark, and who else but the marvelous Charlton Heston, swoops down from heaven in order to save from torture a fellow actor. And here we have the master's highly unusual theory about the origin of the Milky Way. This science fiction will not appeal to purists like Carl Sagan, but it is certainly marvelous the way that an entire galaxy emerges from the star's breast. This is what we call box office. For more refined audiences, we have Veronese, the Fellini of his day. After he decorated Masser, he was asked to paint the Last Supper, but the Inquisition complained. What were all these pets, dwarfs, drunks, German soldiers doing at Christ's Last Supper? This was very much the sort of petulant review that Fellini still gets. So Veronese made a number of changes, but when the Inquisition told him that the dog in the center must be replaced by Mary Magdalene, Veronese refused. Then the censor said, well, why don't you change the painting's title to Feast in the House of Levi? And that is how the picture was finally released. Of all the Venetian painters, Giorgione is the strangest and to me, the most haunting. This picture is called The Tempest for want of a better title. A hot summer day, a flash of lightning in the distance, a wall, a bridge, a woman nurses her child and looks at us. A man walks by and looks at her. We will never know what it is they know, but looking into her face, one sees what she will become when she is old. She is still looking at us, but now she holds in her hand a message. Col tempo. With time, you will be like me. After the great age of painting and empire, Venice began to turn inward. During the plague of 1630, human life seemed more than ever fragile. In desperation, the Venetians built Santa Maria della Salute as a prayer for deliverance from a plague in which 46,490 people died, a third of the population of Venice. An age of religious music now began. Gabriele, Monteverdi, 
croce. In Venice's great days, the Venetians were accused of worshipping not God, but the state. Now they have turned most seriously from state to God. And then came an age of non-religious music. A Frenchman named de Brosse was amazed by the Venetian passion for music. Not a single evening goes by, he wrote, without a concert somewhere. The people run along the canal to hear it with such passion that you would suppose that they had never heard anything like it before. You cannot imagine how crazy the city is about this art. This was the age of Vivaldi and Tartini. Death had concentrated the Venetian mind marvelously well. As the 18th century began, Venice was now ready to sacrifice publicness for privateness, duty for pleasure, the world well lost for romantic love. The Venetians have always been secretive about themselves. In fact, only one ever wrote a proper, improper memoir. It is curious that of the three million Venetians who ever lived, only two, if you don't count artists, are known to all the world. One is Marco Polo, whose house is here. He traveled to China and back again. The other Venetian who is known to all the world is Casanova, who traveled to many beds and back again. It's curious that Casanova is known to all the world as a great lover, thanks to his memoirs, when actually he was his century's most brilliant authority on taxes, not to mention far too much of a free thinker for Venice. In the 18th century, Venice sat for her portrait. The old lady of the sea was not what she was, but the beauty was still there. Business was still good. Tourism had been invented. Every well-to-do young man now made a grand tour, and Venice was often its high point. But in the new age of Rousseau and Voltaire and Jefferson, Venice was no longer relevant, except as an artifact. Yet it still had a form of government that intrigued the thinkers of the so-called Age of Reason. As the Venetian Republic was drawing to its close, the American Republic was being born. And here is the first communication 
From the new American Republic to the old Venetian Republic, it's dated uh, 1784. And it begins, the United States of America in Congress assemble, judging that an intercourse between the said United States and the most serene Republic of Venice, founded on the principles of equality, reciprocity, and friendship, may be of mutual advantage. On the 12th day of May, has issued the commission, et cetera, et cetera. And the three commissioners, American commissioners who are in Paris, request good relations between the two countries and naturally trade. And here are the signatures of the American commissioners. The first is John Adams, the second is Benjamin Franklin, and the third is Thomas Jefferson. The Venetian ambassador in Paris very nicely sent it on here to Venice, to the archives, to the foreign office. And he made a translation, which is pretty good. However, the Venetian ambassador had the same trouble that most Americans did with the handwriting of Thomas Jefferson. So when he comes to put down the names of the commissioners, he gets John Adams correctly. He gets Benjamin Franklin correctly. But poor Thomas Jefferson becomes John Jestinen. Interestingly enough, John Justinen, also known as Thomas Jefferson, so admired the Venetian architect Palladio that he imitated him when he built Monticello, his house in Virginia. But the Venetian Republic itself was no longer a particularly good model for an American or for any republic. With loss of power, the state became ever more paranoid. Citizens were constantly being accused and sometimes convicted of un-Venetian activities. Here we see the government of the day through the eyes of perhaps the worst painter that Venice was ever to produce, Gabriella Bella. The government of a republic that was beginning to lose its nerve. The Council of Ten was as awesome as ever and consisted, very sensibly, of 17 officials. The Three Inquisitors. Their official task was to prevent the theft of state secrets. In practice, they decided which of the accused should live and which should die. Or, as the Venetians used to whisper, the Ten send you to the torture chamber. The three send you to your grave. These are the files of the Inquisition for the year 1755. On the left-hand side, they note what the crime was that someone was found guilty of, and on the right-hand side, you get the sentence. Here is one Giacomo Casanova has been found guilty of acts against the holy religion, which actually means that he had introduced two young noblemen to Freemasonry. The Inquisition finds Giacomo Casanova guilty and they sentence him to five years in prison under the Piombi. These are the leads, the roof of the Ducal Palace. As you can see and hear, the prison cells beneath the leaded roof were to be a major influence on the works of our own splendid Vincent Price. Balzac saw Casanova's cell, he said, well, all in all, he had seen apartments in Paris that were a lot worse. Now, two years pass. It is the year 1757. Giacomo Casanova has escaped from the prison. And here's a description in the left-hand corner of how he escaped with a priest and how they walked over the roof of the building of the Ducal Palace. 
Then it goes on to say that this is all the fault of the prison warden. And the prison warden, a gentleman called Basadona, is now sentenced himself to 10 years in his own prison. Only unlike Casanova, he is not under the eaves, he's down in the dungeons. One thing about the Inquisitors, they played hard ball. Well, Napoleon Bonaparte came to town and the most serene republic serenely expired. And that was the end of Venice as a great capital. It became a part of Austria. And then the romantic century began, the 1800s. During the 1800s, it seems that just about every romantic or would-be romantic figure came to stay in this city. And it's curious to find what it was that each saw here. And I suspect it had a lot to do with the romantic disposition. Originally an old palace, the Daniele was and is a favorite hotel for celebrated romantics. The 19th century was the first century to develop and cultivate a sense of the past. The cult of old things was everywhere the rage, and what was older and more picturesque than Venice? Charles Dickens arrived here at night. When he looked out this window the next morning, he said, inventive as always, no words can describe the freshness of the air, the sparkling of the water under the rays of the sun that shines in the clear blue sky. You can tell that Dickens was paid handsomely by the word, and no word ever failed him. But what Dickens saw and felt, people still think they see and feel in Venice. In that most romantic of all centuries, the 19th, the agony of the romantics was best enacted, so they thought, in Venice, the perfect setting for their dramas. Henry James said that Venice is the repository of consolations, an ideal place for someone with a broken heart or someone looking for a heart to break. The most romantic figure of the century, Lord Byron, wrote a good deal of his poem Don Juan here, in between long rovings into the night in search of girls. Here on the Grand Canal, Richard Wagner worked on his opera, Tristan and Isolde. And here, Wagner died. Robert Browning was the most sturdy survivor of a most tiring but totally romantic attachment to a lady who wrote the motto of the Romantic Age, I shall but love thee better after death. Love and death were the great themes and constantly intertwined. George Sand came here with Alfred de Musée. Upon arrival, he told her, George, I do not love you. So she wrote a novel. George Eliot came here with her young husband. On their first night together, he flung himself out of the bedroom and into the Grand Canal. All in all, 
Venice is not a lucky city for women in love called George. Happily, there were a number of non-practicing romantics who stayed out of canals. This palace was bought and restored by an American family in the 1880s. Here, the greatest of American novelists, Henry James, used to come and stay. It is nice to think of him at my age and weight, struggling up these lopsided stairs. The rooms are still pretty much the way they were when James lived here, and Browning gave readings in this room, and John Singer Sargent and Monet painted. The furnishings of these rooms were assembled by the American owners only a century ago. Within the shell of an ancient palace, they acted out their own dream of Venice, with considerable tact. James used this palace as a setting for the wings of a dove. I have this vast, cool upper floor, he wrote, all Scirocco drafts and easy undressedness quite to myself. These ever adorable, never more so, marble halls. At this desk, Henry James wrote the Aspern papers. I must say I was rather dubious when the owner of the palace told me this. And she said, why? And I said, well, I don't think there's a writer who was ever born, with the possible exception of Ernest Hemingway, who could write with a mirror in front of him and his own face reflected. And she laughed and she said, well, actually James didn't. And she showed me a photograph of the way the desk looked when he was here. And as you will see, he wisely removed the mirror. Until this century, the gondola was the preferred way of getting about the canals of Venice. Though there are now fewer gondolas and gondoliers than there were in Henry James's day, they still attract tourists who enjoy the way that the gondoliers throw themselves, in James's words, over the tremendous oar. It has the boldness of a bird and the regularity of a pendulum. Other visitors in the past found the gondola somewhat too creepily reminiscent of a coffin. But the poet Clough was thrilled. He wrote, how light we move, how swift we are, were life but as the gondola. To which one might add, if life were like the gondola today, life would be far too expensive to live. On the other hand, the beauty of the gondolier's voices raised in song is perhaps beyond price. gondoliers are true Venetians. This means that the object of their enterprise is to separate as gracefully and originally as possible the tourist from his money, within the law, of course. 
Venice Incorporated is still very much in business. The tourists arrive in their hundreds of thousands from all over the world. In fact, it seems to be an eternal law of tourism that the smaller the place, the greater the crowd. And Venice caters for the tourist at every level. There is a gambling casino, there is an annual film festival, and every two years there is an exhibition of art to which the artists of each country contribute their most glorious artifacts. Here we can ponder some of the finest works of the apre postmodernist movement. <laughs> As we can see, painting and sculpture have developed enormously since the days of Carpaccio and Veronese and Giorgione. Although Venetians have always preferred mastery to novelty in the arts, they are willing to settle for a supermarket if they have to. But then they are traditionally tolerant. I must say in all of my many years of attending the Biennale that this is probably the most beautiful work of art that I have seen here. As it is, it's exquisitely made of sand with violent and even tragic colors of the sort that, well, I must say, I haven't been this moved since the famous rocks from the Tate Gallery were entered here one by one several years ago at that significant Biennale. For centuries, the doge from his gilded barge would drop a wedding ring into the sea to celebrate the marriage between the sea and the most serene republic. This scene is still enacted once a year for the tourists. Now, of course, there is no doge, no ring, no marriage. The sea no longer wedded, no longer domesticated, now reclaims its right to the whole lagoon. Water gave birth to Venice. Water made Venice rich, first with salt, then with ships and trade. Now with tourists who come to see themselves reflected in Venice. Venetian glass is like Venetian water. You are reflected. The reflection is real, but is the thing reflected real? Venetians tend to prefer reflection to the flesh and the mask to either. And so, flesh, farewell. Carnevale.
siete belli! Jack! Jack Stegina! As the 20th century draws to a close, no one knows quite what to expect, if anything, of the future. So there is a strong need for magic, for a place outside time, for a postponement of reality, for Venice. Oh, my God.